My name is Marcia Robinson, and we are recording an oral history with Sherry Perrette as part of the Sweet Mummeries Oral History Project. This project marks the 50th anniversary of the Miami University Middletown, Ohio campus. This interview is taking place on March 24, 2017 at the Gardner Harvey Library on campus. Mrs. Peratt, do I have your consent to proceed with this interview? Absolutely. It's my Thank pleasure. You. Could you please tell us about your first connection to Miami Middletown? Hmm. I believe my first connection with Miami University Middletown was um, right before I re-enrolled. Um, I had been a, uh, I was obviously a non-traditional student. I was in my 40s. Um, we had moved back from um, Florida and um, it was at a time when uh, it became very clear to me that um, women, that women needed to have, have an education on their own. So um, uh, I didn't have, and I was, my husband was very successful uh, in contracting. But I also had children and I had a lot of obligations, you know, responsibilities. So um, uh, I had attended Miami back in, this, in the 60s. <laughs> I hate to put that out there, but that's, that's where we met. And then the war came and I dropped out of school and just never thought it was important until we moved back here and, um, and times changed. And I saw the need and I thought, you know, what am I gonna do? with my life if something happens. I won't be able to get a job. I don't have any, not, you know, I've raised kids, which is, that's great, but that's not gonna get me a job. So um, I came over here to Mum, and uh, uh, everybody was just, you know, welcoming, friendly, um, didn't have any issues at all. They were happy to have me. And um, uh, my husband was not happy. He said, uh, you need to go to UC, you'll finish in half the time. And I said, yeah, but I won't have a Miami degree. And um, uh, so that end of that, and I made up my mind I was going to go to Miami, even if it took longer. And I've never regretted that decision. So you're a Miami merger. Yes. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Oh, it was wonderful. It really was. Uh, it, it started out a little, a little differently. Um, we weren't uh, immediately attracted to one another. Um, but you know, the more uh, you know, you get to know someone. You, I don't know, it just blossomed, and uh, um, I, I learned to appreciate things about him, and he learned to appreciate things about me, and just one thing led to another, and you know, we've been together for 51 years, so that's that. <laughs> that's, um, did the Vietnam War have anything to do with um, your education or your education plans? Uh, that's a hard question to answer. I would say indirectly it did, because um, when you when we got married, uh, we got married specifically to to avoid him being uh, sent to Vietnam. Because and I have no problem saying this, I was not in favor of the Vietnam War. To, I appreciate the tremendous sacrifice that was made, but I was not happy with the way it was the way we were pulled into it. And I definitely didn't want him going. And you know, he was gonna be a chopper pilot and I, that was, it would have been, I just didn't. And so when you got married, he didn't have to go to war. Um, and, uh, and then I was, I, then I had a child on the way. So that, that took care of that. <laughs> and, um, and that I think in a roundabout way it did because it, it interrupted my education. If that hadn't been there, I think I probably would have continued on and gotten my degree normally. Several people have mentioned that in the early days of mom, there were many women who had been stay-at-home mothers who suddenly felt a need to finish that degree. Can you talk about that need to finish the degree? How did that feel back then? Well, here's, here's my take on it. I think, had, I think it was meant to be the way it was because I think when I was over at Miami at 19, that I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was in the teaching program, I didn't like it, I wasn't happy with that. I was in uh, physical education, I didn't like that. And I, I just really didn't know what I wanted to do. I was 19, you know. Uh, and in the ensuing years, I had an opportunity then 
to see what life was like, uh, and then you know my children and take care of them. And then, as I said, again, extraneous circumstances, externals. Uh, you know, the world was changing, and women were becoming more and more in the workforce. And um, um, my children were of an age where they didn't need me. I mean, I had long periods of time when they were at school. And um, I'm pretty active mentally. And, uh, and I always felt like that was unfinished business. And, and I know that it hurt my, my parents when I didn't finish school because I was the first one in my family to go to college. And um, my father, I was an only child. So my father never forgave me for not finishing. Uh, he loved me, but I always knew that that was, that was something that deeply hurt him. And at the time, you know, when you're 19, you just, you don't, you don't think about those things. You just, you're in love and you're gonna, everything's gonna be great. <laughs> but at that point in time, when we moved back, um, my kids were getting older and they were gonna need to go to college. And my husband was making good money, but um, Something could happen, he's in construction, you know. And the, how would I put them through school? How would I take care of myself? And, and then there was this unfinished business. And I thought, why should, you know, I know I've got credit hours. I'd gone to school quite, you know, two years. So I, um, almost two years, I think I'd got 40 credit hours. And I thought, you know, I can do this. And uh, so I went to, to mom and, um, I was scared to death when I went, but everybody was just, you can do this. No, you, you know, you got 40 hours in, you, you know, we can get you going. I mean, it was all very positive. And um, they had uh, some resources for me, and, um, and then there were student loans, which I was careful how I used them. But my husband was making pretty good money, so, you know, he was able to help. And uh, so that's how I came back to mom. I just, and as I said, he wanted me to go to UC because he said, you'll get out and you'll be working a lot faster. And I said, yeah, but it won't be Miami. <laughs> you mentioned that you started at Oxford, but you came back to the Middletown campus. Can you tell us about the relationship between the campuses and what that Miami degree might mean? Well, the, the primary concern for me personally and coming back uh, was to get a Miami degree. Now, I, I frankly didn't care if it was if it was it said Miami Middletown, if it, as long as it said Miami University somewhere on the degree. the The big um, deciding factor for me was that I had still had kids in school. Um, I could practically I could ride a bike to come to school here which I certainly couldn't do driving to Oxford. Uh, the drive to Oxford was very off-putting, I will tell you that, um, and I'm not alone in that. Um, uh, when we finally did make, make the break to go over to Oxford, I, there were many, many times that I did not like the idea of being on that road late at night after a full day of classes. I will also say, and I don't know if this is, this is just my experience, is that um, as a non-traditional student, older student, going on to the uh, Miami main campus, uh, it was, there was a lot of discrimination. There really was. Um, age discrimination, um, uh, an attitude that, oh, she's a non-trad student from, from uh, um, Middletown or Hamilton. Um, and the idea of trying to include us or bring us on into the, the mainstream, um, that didn't happen. Now, I never had a problem because I just went on. <laughs> and I got along really great with the, the, the younger kids once they got to know me and found out that I didn't have any, I mean, I, I was just like anybody else. I never let anything like that bother me. But it was, it was clearly there, and an inferiority, um, you know, that we were not as good Otherwise, we would have been in Miami from the from the beginning, and that's that's just not true. You know, I mean, people have uh, monetary constraints, family constraints that made this campus absolutely um, imperative for success. I I would not have been I if I had had to go to Miami directly, I probably would have gone to UC because they had other they had satellite campuses. If this satellite campus hadn't been here, I wasn't going to drive 
all that way over to Miami to, to finish my degree. I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> Were there, was there a community of non-traditional students here? Did you support each other, find each other? Oh, yeah. Can you yeah. talk about that community? Yeah. Oh, it was, it was wonderful because there were a um, great number of us, really. Um, I found that I wasn't the only one. And one of the, the most wonderful friendships I ever uh, formed was with a, a non-traditional student here that we both took, um, um, we both took uh, philosophy of religion. <laughs> and uh, uh, we still laugh about it to this day because we're still re very good friends. And as it turned out, um, uh, she went on and got her master's degree in um, um, uh, uh, social work and therapy and as a therapist here. And um, uh, she also, she and her husband went on to be one of my uh, biggest supporters of the, of the campus um, as, as, you know, donor. And uh, still is very, very active in the community. So uh, um, we, you know, that, that, and then just, um, I don't know, there were just a lot of us, a, a lot of people that were non-trad non students that were here at the time. And we all got along well with the young students that were here. It was seemed like when we went went across the bridge, <laughs> or went across seventy three, um, and it may have just been a cultural thing. You know, it may have just been a cultural thing. But um, you know, when you really got down to the nitty gritty, and I had to work in communications, and we had teams, and I was the oldest person on that team, uh, it turned out to be that some of the kids. I call them kids, uh, that were on my team, they ended up relying on me because I was a little older and I was a little wiser maybe. I don't know, but we ended up, we had a really, we had a very good rapport. And, um, you know, we, the non-traditional thing became a non-issue, so. I'd like to talk about the transition from school to work. <laughs> How did you come to be an employee at Miami Middletown? Well, um, when I got over to Miami and I was I was in my forties, the uh, all the professors said, "We got to get you through. We got to get you through." You know, you're you're you're. Um, they didn't want to come out and say I was too old, <laughs> but they recognized that uh, you know, getting started at that the age I was in in a career like journalism or public relations was going to be difficult if I didn't get going. So I mean, I really worked hard to get, I mean, I got as high grades as I could. I mean, I got every award I could get, you know, anything to make me stand out. And, um, but it was rough. Uh, I, I went and I applied, I don't know how many places. And the minute they, they found out that my age, never heard from them again. And, um, uh, some people would say this was fate. I don't believe in that. I believe that I believe that, that there's something more. And um, the, it turns out that there was an opening here for uh, an assistant for public relations. And I was a member of the Alumni Association, the Middletown Alumni Association, and they had a dinner every year. And um, I thought, I need to go to that dinner and just see you know, what's going on and see who's there. And um, so quite by coincidence, <laughs> I sat with um, Dick Solman, who was the head of public relations at the time, and um, also with, um, oh, why can't I think of his name? It was a senior moment. Uh, he was the head of, um, oh, Derbyshire, Lynn Derbyshire and, and his wife and several others, um, faculty members, I sat it and we got to talking and uh, uh, let them know that I was one of their non-traditional graduates and that you know, I was looking for a job. And, and Dick said, well, I'm looking for an assistant. So he gave me his card and he said, come see me on Monday. And Lynn had said the same thing. Lynn had said, I'm looking for somebody that can, you know, fill in some, do some work for me. And he said, I can't promise you anything. So I talked to both of them, uh, but Dick was the only one that really had a plan and had, you know, he had money put aside to hire somebody. And, um, and I just, 
Um, I had been involved in the community. I had, was getting involved as a volunteer, uh, so there were a couple other places I was looking at, but he really opened the door. And, um, um, and of course, the university takes a long time. <laughs> Take a long time, you know, to do hiring. You know, it's, it's weeks and weeks. And I was relentless. <laughs> I really was. I'm amazed I got the job because I just kept calling him. And then, but then um, uh, I had good recommendations, and I had good recommendations from the community. And I and because Dick was so involved with the community, that carried a lot of weight. I don't know, you know, why he hired me, <laughs> but he did. And um, and I was excited. I was really excited. It wasn't much pay. It was really really low pay, but. Um, uh, and I was excited too because I loved mom. And I thought, you know, this is gonna be so much fun. I'm gonna be able to get, be creative. I'm gonna use my, my degree, my journalism degree, you know, I can talk about mom. And that wasn't lost on Dick either because he was a really smart cookie when it came to um, public relations and promoting the campus. So, uh, so what did you learn from, from Dick Solman? Oh, I learned a lot about politics. <laughs> Uh, academic politics, and um, uh, he taught me a lot about uh, um, how to maneuver in in the uh, in the culture. And uh, uh, he was always, you know, very supportive. Um, he was very creative, which I liked. Um, so you know, I mean, I think that pretty much covers it. You know, he. Uh, I think he was pretty much in my corner until, until I um, applied for the development job and didn't tell him. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the development job. Okay. Well, I'd been there for two years, and the pay was not very good, and I had, wasn't getting, it wasn't a full-time job. It was like 32 hours, so I wasn't getting any benefits. And um, and he was talking about the uh, that they were going to come up with a, a development program because the, um, the campus hadn't raised any money since its inception. It had been you know everything had been subsumed over into Oxford, and um, he was wanting to get a development program going here, and he was going to they were going to hire a development director, and. He kept talking about how great everything was going to be, and then they put out the they put out the uh, uh, what do you call it the prospectus, um, the job description, and and I looked at it and um, I thought you know what I I can do all that <laughs> I can do all of it, uh, but I didn't want to say anything I really didn't want to say anything to him because I didn't want to upset him. And I knew that he didn't want me to do it. I mean, which is natural. I mean, why would he want me to go? I mean, I was doing work for him. And um, so anyway, um, I waited until the last day for them to take in resumes. And I, I worked very hard. I went out and got five uh, recommendations. One was the editor of the local newspaper, which was Jim Mills. One was a um, uh, potential donor that I, had, that I came to, to find out about. That I also knew the um, oh the C the chief financial officer we were friends and and it was a, a big company that they were Miami was wooing so I got him to give me a, a letter of rec I got a Miami grad that was an attorney here in town that was well respected on the campus and I'm trying to think who else that might have been the only three I had but but. The one that really caught everybody's eye was, was Jim Mills, who was the head of the um, uh, Middletown Journal, because he was known as a, you know a person of high integrity, and that he didn't he normally wouldn't do anything like that. So um, anyway, I I waited till the last minute, got my resume together, got my references together, walked I remember walking up that hallway in the old building and walking up to Marion Cottrell's office and the brown paper envelope and, the, and handing it to her and I said this is my application for the development office and uh, development director and she just kind of looked at me like okay 
And so things were kind of iffy after that. Um, and I went back then and I, then I did tell, tell him that I had applied. And um, he didn't say much. And, um, and then um, there were 43 other applicants, some of whom had um, master's degrees. Uh, but I knew everyone in the room when I went in for the interview. And this is a cute story because it, it has really affected my life. And I, this person is, I'm very close to her to this day. Um, I was scared beyond belief <laughs> going into this room full of people that were going to, you know, search committee that was going to look me over one. And I knew I was up against. It meant so much to me. And when I came into my little cubicle that morning, there was a little post-it note on the seat of my chair, and it said, knock them dead, MLF. Well, the MLF stood for Mary Lou Flynn. <laughs> and I'm sure you've interviewed Mary Lou. <laughs> and um, uh, that just did it. I'm, I mean, it was like somebody just, you know, like a coach saying, you can do this, you got it. Go in there and knock them dead. And so I went in, I was prepared, and I just let it all out. And um, uh, I remember uh, Jack O'Neill, who was the vice president of First National Bank, was on the committee. And he saw, he saw my reference from Jim Mills. And he says, you got a letter of rec from Jim Mills? He says, That's, he says you you know what you're doing, girlfriend. You know what you're doing. He says, so you get my vote. So I didn't know how it was going to go. And um, I left, and I just left it there. And I thought, I'm either going to get it or, you know, I'm probably not going to be here that much longer. And um, as it turned out, um, I, I came back from lunch. And um, this was several, you know, like a week or so later. They did a lot of other interviews. And uh, Dr. Governani called me in the office and said, you got the job. So uh, then I was really scared. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. So let's talk about um, some of the campaigns you came up with. Um, can you talk about the Founders Club? Well, I think what you, you, if you don't mind, we need to start at the beginning. Okay, let's do that. Okay, okay. The, um, the campus hadn't, risen, hadn't, hadn't raised any money from outside, for, from anybody. Uh, it was, um, the problem we had was that alumni here then went to Oxford. And the minute they went to Oxford, they identified with Oxford. They no longer identified. Now, Oxford was very supportive at that time. Um, I can't remember the, the lady's name that was there, head of advancement, but she, she, get, she gave me tons of alumni contacts here. And I got started on the list, and I just got the same answer everywhere. I just, it was, no, you know, yeah, we think mom's great. I mean, everybody thought it was great, but I'm giving my money to Oxford. That's where I graduated, and that's what my degree says, and that's what I'm doing. So um, I started to think, well, how are we going to get this off the ground? And then I thought, well, if we're going to ask, we're going to get, we're going to have to go to the community. That, I thought, we're going to have to go to the community. That's where the money's going to come from. And so I decided that the best thing we could do would be to start, if you're going to give, what you've heard the this, this saying, if giving begins at home. And I had gone to a seminar that the university sent me to to help train me for the position. And uh, one of the things they uh, impressed me with was that a faculty staff campaign can be an integral part of kicking off a, a new fundraising effort. So that's what we did, and we did a faculty staff campaign. It was a very short, a short bre brevity, and it was centered around scholarships, um, give from the heart. Scholarships make a difference, give from the heart. I knew I had to have buy-in from everybody. I had to have it from faculty, staff, students. We had a component. Um, we had a blast doing it. Um, and we centered it all around Valentine's Day. And then we made it a contest, and that's where it got very interesting. We didn't base it on money raised. We based it on participation. And the goal was to have 100% participation by everybody. And um, uh, it became quite the thing, because we had a big thermometer 
actually we had heart, a heart. It wasn't a thermometer, it was a heart. And we had the different categories, the different constituents, faculty, um, faculty, unclassified, classified, faculty, and students. And um, each of them had a, I don't know, a, a bar or whatever, I can't really remember. But anyway, we did skits. We went around and, and asked them to sign up to pledge. Uh, and we really emphasized doing payroll deduction. And everybody said, you can't do that. The last time they did it here, it was a disaster. People, they, they didn't get accredited. And I said, well, we're gonna do it. And I said, we're gonna make sure that they know that their money's safe and that, that this is the easiest way to do it. And to make a long story short, at one point, one of the faculty members came down and they were in third place. And she had a cow. This can't go on. <laughs> she says, faculty has to be in first place. So that became a real thing, you know, where there was a competition. I got, I got faculty members to wear sandwich boards. I actually have pictures of them wearing sandwich boards and coming, going around to different places. <laughs> and we just had so much fun. And we did get uh, the highest percentage that we knew of at the time um, of giving of any, um, any campus anywhere. It was uh, something like 98% participation rate. We had, we had two holdouts. And uh, we, did have, we did have one person who um, got pretty aggravated and we just had to just say, look, he, he's made it clear he doesn't want to do it. We're, this isn't what we're about, you know. We don't have to have 100%. So um, uh, that's what got us started. And then, then that, the, the, um, that's what that picture is with me in the hat. We had a big kickoff for the, for the faculty staff campaign. We had bands, we, had, we invited the community in, and you know, Dr. G spoke, I spoke, and we told the community, look, we need your support, but we want you to know we believe in who we are. And we believe in who we are, and we're going to raise enough money to fund a scholarship. And we did. We, we, that's how the faculty uh, staff scholarship came about. I've heard that one of the early donors for a major gift um, was Venus and Ruth Maupin. Can you give us a story about how that happened? <laughs> yes. Um, I was brand new, and um, um, Venus was a real, he was a real character, but he was, he loved Miami, and he, he sold insurance, and he and his wife didn't have any children, and um, I met, I only met Ruth later after he passed away, but he was very good friends with, um, um, with Dick Solman, and he would come by the office, and Dick would get him tickets for things, and, you know, and then um, he passed away, and um, I don't know what went on behind the scenes, but it, it, in any case, <coughs> D Dix said to me, we need to, we need to go visit with Ruth. And um, so we did, and we went and visited with her, and she and I hit it off right away. And I said, you know, we just want to do what you think that he would want to have done. And um, one thing led to another, and she uh, made up her mind that she didn't want to give the money to Oxford. She was going to give a, a large portion to uh, Middletown, and at that point, then, that was the wonderful thing about development. If people, if it works right, um, you have other people that you can pull in. It's not like you know it wasn't my gift. It was a gift to our school, and um, uh, so that's when I called on Oxford, and we had one of their top people who knew how to craft things come over and talk with her. And it took quite a while, but we crafted this um, hundred thousand dollar. Uh, charitable remainder trust, and along with that, we also had a five hundred thousand dollar bequest. Now the bequest never happened, and that sometimes happens with bequests because you got family members, you got a lot of people, and there were a lot of a lot of there were, not everybody was really happy with what Ruth did. Uh, but then she also then uh, turned over all of the monies that came in to her from that um, crut back over to us. Okay. Uh, it was around, uh, oh, I don't know, it was seven, eight thousand dollars a year, you know, that it was earning, and um, uh, so with that, then we we um, we just we just became good friends. I mean, she would call me up and say, "Come on over to the house, and and um, uh, we'll have happy hour." And she was she was alone at that point in time, and and up in years, but just a she was just 
a delightful person. She had so many stories. They'd traveled all over the world. And uh, she just loved, she just loved everything about it. And she loved the students. She loved the interaction. And so um, anyway, she decided, I said, we need a, a fully funded scholarship. And she said, well, how much would it be? And I said, well, I think what you're already giving, we could designate as that. And um, that's the way I'm recalling it. And it might have, there might have been more to it. But <clears throat> the amount of money um, funded three, didn't just fund one. So those are those three people that you see that were uh, the first to have four years of college paid for uh, without, the, it was renewable. And she was thrilled to do it. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, some other donors that you may have some insight on. Uh, do, what about um, Barry Levy and, and his wife? Do you have any stories about Mrs. Levy that you can share with us? Well, she was a very private person, um, very, very personable and very gracious. I mean, uh, Mary Lee was always, um, uh, always impeccably dressed, and, and which was, I mean, I admired that. And um, very devoted to Barry, very devoted to his family, very um, mm -hmm. quiet, um, much the person who was in the background. Uh, Barry was always the, you know, the flamboyant one that was, and, and there was nothing wrong with that. It was just who Barry was. He was a, a state senator, and um, uh, he did a tremendous amount for uh, Middletown. And, of course, his father was uh, Elliot and May Levy, and they, um, um, they, did, they were the ones who started <clears throat> the community foundation with a challenge grant, I think, of about six million dollars. Well, it wasn't six million dollars. I think at one point it got up to six million. I, that might not be true, but th their money got that off the ground. And um, uh, Barry was always very supportive of uh, the Middletown community and the Middletown campus and Oxford. I mean, he was he was a trustee for uh, uh, Oxford, um, and he was on. A lot of different committees, and, that, and I need to bring that up, is that along with the community and trying to raise money from the community, I realized that I w it's, this is not done in a vacuum, that I needed to have help. And so I formed what we call the Development Advisory Committee. And that was eight to, to nine um, people in the community who, have, who were affluent, uh, who were influential, and who were committed to um, the com community. And they, act, they really were my right arm. I mean, when we got ready to do something, that it, we would have our meeting, and I would bring it to them. And then, you know, if it was something they thought was, was going to work, they'd say. But if it was something they thought well, that wasn't going to work, they'd say, forget it. <laughs> That's not going to work. And Barry was on that. Um, and uh, more as an advisory, I mean, he wasn't there a lot because was, Barry was everywhere. But Mary Lee was um, just a very devoted. She was extremely devoted to him, and um, she was just um, she was just uh, crushed when he died. It was it was it was very hard on her, and um, um, I'm not sure. I think she still um, is in the background and does certain things uh, for the university, but I wouldn't know what. Um, so, in fact, her coming to the gala without him was a big, that was a big deal. Um, is this the 40th anniversary, Kayla? The 40th. Well, we were still, I think we were still trying to raise money for the campus center. And uh, I mean, the campus center was already built and it was gonna be dedicated. And so we wrapped the 40th anniversary celebration around uh, the dedication of the uh, campus center. And, um, Kelly wanted to, she wanted to have a, a big gala, and uh, uh, Kelly Cowan, yeah, she was the, at that time, she was the uh, new executive, I don't know what her title was, executive director. She had, uh, Mike had um, retired. Mike. And Mike Governanti, and he had, he had retired, and um, uh, so anyway, this this came up, and um, and my my thought of it, well, we got a we got a committee together. You can't do anything of that size without a committee. 
But we had, <clears throat> there had been several comments made about what this fabulous gala that Miami had put on back in 2006, and that was uh, they had turned Millette Hall into a Chicago speakeasy. And it, it was an amazing thing. I, th I don't know how much money they spent, but it was a lot of money. <laughs> but it was, it was unbelievable. They had, um, uh, I don't know how many bars. I mean, and the whole, the Millet Hall, you can imagine that, converting it into, and it looked like a speakeasy. And it was a sit-down dinner. Students served it. Um, it, was, it was amazing. It was amazing. They hired some, some gal out of Cincinnati. So anyway, we couldn't do anything like that. But... We decided that, well, we could do our own, and um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to have a whole, a whole um, month of activities. Um, the Casper Lecture was coming up. We decided April was the best time to do it, which uh, was when everything happened anyway. So we wanted to have the Casper Lecture. We thought about having an art exhibit and then that turned into an art auction because we wanted to try to use uh, the gala to further the development efforts and, um, and to raise some money. Um, and then um, to just uh, have a party and, ex and celebrate who we were and, um, uh, and bring the, ki the kids in and everything. And I, I don't know who came up with the idea. I, I think I might have. But it also might have been the committee. I mean, we were all in there. We were brainstorming, which you always get a lot of good ideas. Anyway, we came up with Back to the Future. And um, What's Back to the Future? Back to the Future was a, a, a movie. And um, uh, it had the DeLorean. And it, it kind of embodied what we saw as uh, Mum's next 40 years. That, you know, we look back. People, and there were all kinds of things, look back, look forward, but didn't have any oomph to it. So, you know, when we said back to the future, that pretty much said it all. And um, so we said, well, let's just use that as a theme. So then, then we got to looking at the movie and all the things that were going on there. And I thought, boy, wouldn't that be fabulous if we could actually get the DeLorean and have that there that night. So... Um, Lo and behold, I went online and I found it. <laughs> and it wasn't that expensive. <laughs> so, so they said they would bring it. And um, the, the DeLorean from the movie. Movie, right. And, uh, and they said they would, the, the, I can't remember, it was a, an actor that had bought it. And um, he was doing this to make money. I mean, they took it to events. So we, that was the that was the big the big thing then Back to the Future and then the art department we got them involved, and they built the uh, clock tower, and, and that was in the in the uh, in Hawk Haven, and um, we, this thing got it got going and it got bigger and it got bigger and no matter how hard I tried <laughs> to say this is getting you know too big. People wanted to do it, so we just said, okay, well, we'll do this, and we'll do that, and we ended up with two bands. We had um, uh, Phil Dirt and the Dozers. Wow. <laughs> you know Phil Dirt and the Dozers? Well, he was in the uh, Hawk Haven area, and we, we did it so that uh, everything was different in each of the rooms, and we had uh, catering by... Um, Carolyn Catering, the, the Miami Catering Group. And um, anyway, we had Phil Dirt and the Dozers in, the, in Hawk Haven, and that's where the um, Back to the Future um, scenery was. We had um, a ongoing, um, on a loop, the history of, uh, on a PowerPoint that was, you know, like a video that we ran. We had um, a choir, which was a community choir and the mum choir, and they sang, um, and, they, and we also dedicated the building, so we didn't have enough things going. <laughs> and then in the other room, in the main room, we had um, uh, Rod Nymphs and Julius Davis from the Friends concert, and we made that room into a more formal for the older people. <laughs> For the for the for the more non traditional people and for the community and we had a dance floor we put a dance floor in it uh, it was checkered, 
and um, uh, we had all kinds of lighting that we we had a lighting um, company that they had used in Oxford and I talked to the guy and I said look we don't have Oxford's money and anyway he was able to do a fantastic job we had gobos we had lights coming in every direction it was it was really amazing and um, everybody just had a blast we had Kelly was insistent that every woman have a um, feather boa uh, when she came in and that all the men got red carnations so um, uh, it was it was we had um, the students worked as valets and as cloak check, coat checks. The weather had been beautiful, and we were going to have an, a car show, a um, classic car show, and um, Lynn Darbyshire was going to bring all of his, he had the whole thing, and we were going to set it right out there in front of the new building. And boy, oh boy, God had other, other, <laughs> had other, other ideas. The weather, weather gods had other ideas because it turned cold, and it rained, and it snowed. The night of the event, and it was it was just the worst. But we had the DeLorean, and we had pictures taken with it, and uh, uh, it was just a wonderful evening. I mean, we just you know it was just fantastic. Then we had a picnic uh, that followed. We had the, the lecture series. Um, we had a, an auction that night of um, uh, all kinds of things. In fact, um, this was one of the pieces that was auctioned off. Um, it's made by um, a Miami person who was, his son makes them, but he, he was uh, Stausland, Mick Stausland. Um, he was the head of the architecture department at Miami for years, and he, he did several buildings at Miami. His son followed in his footsteps, but he did, he did jewelry, and he made these Mum 40. This was the um, thing that we auctioned off. And the wonderful story about this is that they auctioned it off, and the, the people that bought it, the donors that bought it, paid 10 times what it really was worth. And then when I, I retired the next year, um, that donor and uh, another couple took me to dinner, and they presented it to me and thanked me for all I'd done. And it meant more to me than anything. So it has a very special meaning. And uh, so we had a wonderful time. I didn't sleep for two or three days, but uh, everybody, you know, talked about it. And everybody, I mean, we just had, we had a great time. We had a great time. And I think that people realized, you know, that the, the campus wasn't, I think we kind of just made it clear to the community that we are the asset we are. And that um, we, just because we're academics, we can't let our hair down. We can, you know. So uh, it, was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I'd like to talk some more about the student community connection. Um, there's a couple of events that happened during your time in development that I'd like more details about. One of those would be the story of Ryan Green. Oh my, you know, I was trying to think, the, I was laying awake last night thinking about what are the three things that, that impacted my life the most while I was here. That I, that I would consider something I did that made a true difference to somebody in a personal way. And um, I would say that the Ryan Green story was at the top of my list. And um, actually, I think I brought a letter that's out there that I received from Gr uh, Brian's mother um, thanking me. I framed it um, because. Um, it was a very sad story. His tree is out front in the library, the tree that's out front on the library where you see the, the, um, the bouquets of flowers um, that was planted in his honor. He was a student here and um, worked in the library, worked in a lot of different places, and Ryan was just a delight. I did not know him. I knew of him, but I, he didn't work in my area, so I didn't know him. And um, we had a campus picnic every year. And we had it down at the tennis courts, and um, uh, he was helping to set up and uh, carry everything down, and, and that was just Ryan. And um, uh, he uh, went back up after the picnic, and he went into the locker room, and um, and he died. Because everybody, you know, they knew that family needed help and everything, so they raised. We had about five thousand dollars. 
And I don't know who gave the father my name, but it came to my attention. And he came into my, my office, and he was sitting there, and he was just brokenhearted. And he said, you know, I, I want to do something so that Ryan will be remembered. I don't, I don't want people to forget him because he was such a wonderful boy. And I, so we talked, and I said, well, you know, probably the best thing you could do would be to set up a scholarship. And I said, you know, it, it, to me, scholarships, and they still are, they're a form of immortality. They really are. I mean, uh, if you want to remember someone, in my mind, uh, and you have the money to do it, uh, an endowed scholarship is, you know, people don't forget those, they don't forget you. And um, uh, so anyway, the more we talked, the more excited he got. And then I kind of stepped out on the limb, and I said, you know, I think if we work hard and we come up with a, a fundraising plan, we can, we can get this to endowment. And would you want to do that? Would you want to? I said, now here's the, here's the caveat. You got, we have five years to get this to endowment. I said, if it doesn't reach endowment, then the money still remains at Miami, you know, and for them to, to use it, parcel it out. You know, I wanted to make sure that he understood. And he said, I don't care, I, I, I want to give it. Uh, and so, um, <laughs> um, Rod Nimps and I were cohorts in crime. <laughs> <laughs> Good crime. Um, we got together, and um, he. I went into him, and I said, you know, here's 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 where we're at. You know, what can we do? And I, I, to really, he can probably tell you more. But I, to my knowledge, it was just something we just started kicking around, and we thought, well, why don't we just we could do a concert. And, um, and he said, yeah, we could do a concert. He said, um, we, it could be, uh, I got a bunch of buddies that are all, you know, from Miami. And we could, could do a, a friend's concert. They're all, they're all my friends. And then I said, well, yeah, that's, and then I thought of the Beatles song, you know, uh, with a little help from my friends. That's it. I said, that's what we can do. And, we, and we'll promote it that way. So that's how it got started. And um, uh, so we promoted it and had the first um, the first thing, and we made it clear to everybody, we went, we went all out to let everybody know that, that all the proceeds from the ticket sales were going to go to the Ryan Green Memorial Scholarship Fund. We had his picture up there. Um, we, we dedicated the, the whole program to, um, to him and to his parents. They came up from Tennessee and brought their family. And, um, and to me, the, the thing that I'll always remember, and uh, in fact, the other night we watched Forrest Gump. And um, they were sitting behind me, and uh, and, and she was just, they, the family was just devastated, you know. And um, one of the songs that um, they uh, played at the end of the concert was the uh, theme from Forrest Gump with a feather. And um, Rod played it. And somebody dropped a feather, and I could hear this catch in someone's voice, and I turned around, and it was Rosemary, his mom, and tears were streaming down her face. And she looked at me, and uh, I'll just never forget it. She looked at me, and she says, you will never, ever know what this means to us, that you all are doing this for, for Ryan. She said, it helps so much. And, uh, and I thought to myself, you know, that's, that's what you do with money. You know, you, you use it to help other people. And uh, so we, we got there. We got there in nothing flat. I mean, we, we went way beyond the 25 grand. And we had four concerts. And um, they were all friends' concerts. And uh, it was just, to me, that was probably the most important thing I ever did as a uh, development director. And uh, she wrote me a lovely letter when I retired. And I framed it, and they sent me this gigantic, gorgeous bouquet of flowers and she was very upset that I was leaving she said it just won't be the same without you so you said there were two other things mm. the other thing was the campus center I worked 11 years to get that off the ground it was all over the place <laughs> and we came close a number of times um, getting it done, and each time something came up, 
And, um, and then there were those who said, no, they wanted it, wanted it to be a conference center. I mean, when you, when you propose something like that. But in my mind, and I, and I had the, uh, the uh, data to back it up, um, I didn't want it to be some Taj Mahal, you know, thing that we had to run out all the time because, you know, you, you, you go and dead on something like that, you usually don't ever recover it. I wanted it to be for the students, that they needed a place where they could hang out and a place that they would feel were, was their own, a place where it didn't look like, they, they nicknamed, um, Oh, what was the name of the old building? I can't think of the name of the old building. Verity? No, uh, no, it was, a, it was a lecture hall originally. Uh, the Commons. They nicknamed that the cave. <laughs> it was dark. It had been a lecture hall. They turned it into a, you know, a meeting place for students, but it was, they tried, but I mean, the lighting was old. It was it had been done in the 50s. It was, nobody wanted to hang out there. Um, it was uh, actually where, um, I'd have to show you, I guess. You know where the main hallway, you come in Johnson Hall? Well, the first hallway to the left that you go down towards um, the main offices are, it was, it was in there. And it was the old Hawk Haven, actually, with it added on room 107 or 109 or something like that something but it, i mean it was a it was a they re, they called it the cave you know and kids didn't they wouldn't hang out there they didn't want to hang out there and uh, and i said then romans were down and i said you know you need to have something here that will that students want to come here that looks like a college you know that's when they walk in the door that it's bright it's cheery you know you've got you've got um, it just looks neat, you know, <laughs> makes you want to come back. And um, so finally they decided, you know, you're right. You know, we, we, that's what we need. So uh, um, we finally got, got it worked out. And uh, like so many other things, um, then that's one of the good things, but also one of the bad things about Middletown is that everybody has, everybody wants the town to have everything. And they all want it all at once. <laughs> Uh, we no sooner got started on our campaign till there were two more capital campaigns. And uh, uh, that, that, uh, that was a challenge, it really was. But we got it done, and I'm, I was very proud of it. Very, very proud because the kids had a place that was bright, it was cheery, and the community had space. My only regret was that I wanted it bigger. <laughs> I didn't want it huge, but I wanted it bigger so we could have uh, larger events there in the community center because it's pretty limited. I mean, you can, you know, if you have a luncheon, you can't get that many people in there. But, you know, it was what it was, and it was better than what we had. So, you know, it's kind of like what you're dealing with now. Just be happy to have what you can get that's better than what it was. The third thing? Um... Well, I think it's kind of divided between two things. It was first of all my relationship with um, the community members. Um, that was I. I have maintained that for many, many years, even after I've left here. I got very close to many, many of the people that that gave money here, and for the most part, I think when I left, that every one of them liked me. They, you know, they. They were happy with what the work that I did, and that meant a lot to me. It really did. The other thing is the um, um, the increase in scholarship money that I was able to do thirty thirty endowed scholarships under my under my tenure, and because uh, I didn't have that many. Wow. Before we started recording, you mentioned something about the Miriam Knoll. Foundation. Mm -hmm. Did you want to put anything on the record about that? Sure. I think it's uh, been one of the driving forces uh, in uh, this community. I think there there are so many things in this community that would never never have occurred if it hadn't been for the Miriam Knoll and it hadn't been for her foresight. And I use her uh, would use her as a um, a beacon for people uh, uh, who um, have vision. Um, 
that put money away and uh, with the idea that it that when they're gone that there should be something for somebody else and I think we're losing that a lot and um, and it, it's a spirit that needs to be brought back and and actually that's really what I tried to do here it was it was the the donor wall was to encourage the spirit of philanthropy to be reborn on the campus because for 30 some years after the campus was made we didn't raise money we didn't raise a dime that's striking because the founding committees worked so hard to get this campus built and there's the stories of the first five thousand dollar check mm -hmm. to get the campus built did you get to meet any of the founding generation people? Do you have any recollections of them? Uh, yes, there were several that uh, re remained, uh, that were on the donor wall. And actually that's, that's part of the third thing was the donor wall because that was a two year project and uh, we had two committees and it was, you know, a, a lot of people didn't want to have it done. And, and to me it was a, and I said that night, the night that we had the, the opening of it, I said, this will be, and it still is, this will be an indicator of the history of philanthropy at Miami University Milltown. You will be able to come up to this wall 10 years from now, and you'll be able to see how are we doing. Because if it's not growing and you're not getting more money from more people, then you're not, you're not, your philanthropy is in trouble. And um, uh, it has to be, you know, community-based, corporate-based. Um, maybe you can do something now with alumni. I don't know what they're doing a lot with alumni now. Hopefully they are. Uh, but that's, that was the point, you know. And uh, a lot of people that are on that uh, original founders on the bottom of the, the wall, they were the base. Uh, people like Wilbur, the Cohen family. Um, um, I'm trying to think who else, the Levy family. Um, and then there were people at the top of the wall that were uh, what we call lifetime. And they, they had, were the people that actually founded the campus uh, with their money. And that was, would be the Levy family. And oh, I don't know, I can't remember. My mind is, <laughs> I've been away from it for so long. I've been away 10 years. You made another connection, though, uh, between the campus and the community, and that would be the Scholars and Donors Luncheon. Can you talk about that? Uh, well, we, we're always looking for ways um, for people to, I mean, when people give their money to a student, a lot of times they give the money in a scholarship, and especially if you're in a big school like over in Oxford, although they, Oxford, I think, is doing more of that now, too. Uh, but at the time, nobody was doing very much. Uh, to to raise money, you have to have relationships. You have to build relationships, and you have to keep them. And um, uh, you don't do that if you don't nurture them. So um, many of our donors, they get their joy by seeing another student. I mean, a stu the student that they're paying for to go to college to see what they're doing, have a chance to sit down and visit with them, uh, find out what their interests are, what they're going to do with their life when they leave, and they go away. Most of the time they went away, wrote another check. <laughs> uh, if they didn't write it then, they would increase it when it was time to, to do it. But many of them did increase their giving. And, um, um, and that, was, that was part of it. Uh, but the big, the big push was that they should be, uh, the, the kids needed it too. Uh, they needed to learn how to come to a luncheon and learn which fork, <laughs> which knife, because a lot of them, that wasn't something they were probably taught, and that they needed to be in a setting that was a little more formal. And then we always picked two students, uh, usually um, students who were uh, full, uh, fully funded scholarship students, to, uh, to give their testimony um, at, the, at the luncheon. And I, my development advisory committee helped me do it. It didn't cost the university anything because, except for the, the use of, that's why we needed that. Um, we didn't have the um, campus center at the time. So we had this thing in the, in the uh, lobby of Finkelman Auditorium. <laughs> 
which was no small feat, and we still tease Carol Shul. I, can I mention a donor's name or Carol not? Carol has been interviewed. Okay. Well, we t still tease her about her doing doing dishes in the broom closet in a bucket <laughs> after it was over. <laughs> Because there there wasn't any water up there, you know, we, we just had to get it out of the broom closet and we had to clean everything up from there. So, uh, uh, but it was fun and, and it was always in spring. And uh, we, we had some very different things happen. We had, we had some of our students bring their kids, which I think, I think Ruth Willis just, no, oh, no kids. And I was like, yeah, we're gonna have, they brought their kids, the kids are coming. <laughs> They're part of it, so we just got a seat, and they they came in, and it was it was great. We had we had a great time. Now they do it, I think, a little less um, formal. They have the the community center. I think they have like a reception, which makes sense. You know, it doesn't always have to stay the same, but it was fun. I loved it. Are there any other items that you'd like to put into the record for people preparing for the seventy fifth? anniversary of the campus, what would you like to make sure they pay attention to? Oh. I would just like to say that I, that I think that the uh, regional campuses uh, provide a, um, an experience for students who are perhaps not really ready to go onto a four-year university campus. That that uh, it's a smaller, more intimate, and I don't think I don't think everyone lose that. Um, the other thing is that I I would hope that this campus and other regional campuses of Miami would not get caught up in political correctness to the point of um, I believe in free speech, but I believe in free speech for everyone. And that that we always had uh, here a an open dialogue. I mean, if you didn't agree with somebody, you, you could disagree, but it wasn't. They weren't shouted down. There wasn't violence. There wasn't this uh, pervasive feeling that it's my way or the highway. And uh, I would like to see that continue at, at Miami Middletown. And an openness of thought. Um, I, I think that when you don't listen to someone else's viewpoint, you're the loser. So um, uh, you can dis disagree, uh, but, but oftentimes you'll find that some things that are being said, you do agree with. But if you don't hear them, you can't get there. What is the last word you'd like to have for your interview? Oh, it's wonderful. I've never been given the last word. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you for asking me to be a part of this because um, I have been gone for a long time, and um, if you look around, you're not going to see my name anywhere. Um, you know, it wasn't about that, so my name's not, you won't see my name on anything. Um, but I, I am just, uh, I'm just thankful for the career I've had. I wouldn't have had it if it hadn't been for Miami University Middletown, and um, would not also have had it if it had not been for community support. Um, I think it is incredibly important to, uh, for this campus to continue to thrive, for there to be um, this connection, finding connections, building relationships with community members. Um, I just really think that um, I'm thankful for the life that I've been given and the career that I've had because after I left Miami, I mean, it, it didn't end there, and, but it, it certainly did begin with Miami University Middletown. And I would hope that Miami University Middletown would continue the values, uh, the camaraderie, the collegiality. And I guess the, um, the strongest thing is that, um, that students here come away with the feeling that they're they're special, they're unique, not only special and that they're elite, but they are, they have a special place in life, that, that, that they're not just a number, and that, they ha that their education uh, can be used to help others and to help others make a difference. And, and that's what I think we're all here for. 
So that would be my final thing. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of it. And with that, do I have your permission to discontinue the recording? Sure. Thank you. Okay.